country is hit by the sovereign debt crisis, the share of domestic sovereign debt held by the national banking system has sharply increased. I analyze this in a model with optimizing banks and depositors and find that banks have an incentive to gamble on domestic sovereign debt, while depositor sentiments about bank risk taking become self-fulfilling. Policy interventions face a trade-off between offsetting these sentiments and strengthening incentives to gamble. In this paper we ask whether unconventional monetary policy is effective in restoring bank credit supply during crisis. To answer this question, we analyze the ECB three-year LTROs. We show that central bank liquidity successfully reached firms through those banks that were hit the most during the crisis. However, the large liquidity provision also incentivized purchases of risky securities by banks. I look forward to discussing this important trade-off for monetary policy during this exciting forum. When we started thinking about stress testing, it struck us that the financial press was talking a lot about how banks were cleaning up the balance sheets ahead of the tests. So we collected data on how banks behaved in anticipation of the comprehensive assessment, and we do indeed find that banks reduce leverage. However, they reduce leverage by shrinking assets rather than by raising equity, and that suggests that there's a macroprudential dimension to stress testing, since as a regulator you want to make sure there's enough equity in the system as a whole, and not just that each individual bank hits its tier 1 ratio. Around late 2008, authorities across the globe used a diverse set of tools to inject trillions of euros worth of liquidity into distressed banking systems. However, not much research yet has compared these specific tools. My modelling suggests that lending to banks against securities as collateral prevents those securities from being sold, which softens fire selling and preserves banks' capital. The constraint on selling also raises the minimum that illiquid banks must borrow which enhances the authority's ability to discipline liquidity risk-taking using penalty rates. The sharp depreciation of the Hungarian forint in 2009 showed again that currency carry trade can go wrong. As Hungarian firms were left with skyrocketing value of foreign currency debt, they tended to underinvest. This motivated us to explore the macroeconomic consequences of shifting currency mismatch losses from borrowers to banks. We find that if banks have to bear the exchange rate risk, macroeconomic losses are smaller. We investigate the pass-through of the recent sovereign crisis due to direct holdings of distressed sovereign securities in the portfolios of financial intermediaries. We document the sharp credit tightenings by banks more exposed to sovereigns, especially those financial institutions closer to the regulatory capital pressure. We also note the contraction of employment and investment, but only of small firms borrowing from more exposed lenders. Hi, I investigate on how should monetary and macroprudential policies be coordinated in a model in which banks also play a role. According to my findings, monetary policy responding to financial imbalances is welfare improving, although it comes with the cost of higher inflation volatility. Moreover, an institutional arrangement in which monetary policies are set together with macroprudential policies are also welfare improving, even in the case in which price and financial stability goals are assigned to independent authorities. We built a DST model to allow for intermediate materials as an additional factor input in firms' production. What we find is that the marginal cost in the new framework behaves very differently and is stable over the period of Great Recession precisely because the real intermediate input prices were increasing. As a result, the model no longer requires large degree of price rigidities or a flat Phillips curve to explain lack of deflation. We use the model for out of sample forecast and we show that the model can indeed predict most of inflation and output dynamics over this period. Thank you. Before the crisis, European banks used securitization to transfer credit risk. But during the crisis, they issued and retained asset-backed securities, mostly to increase eligible collateral for brick operations. I investigate the capital management of originator banks, and I find that, in the crisis time, banks with an ex-ante weaker liquidity condition obtain larger improvements in risk-based capital ratios after the issuances of eligible ABS. We have seen population growth falling in most developed countries. In this paper, using data for the US, I find a positive link between population growth 
and the so-called natural rate of interest. This means for monetary policy that with falling population growth, nominal interest rates should be lowered as well.